that the ESCC is declaration that with your wealth declarations. Now, on the question of the lifestyle audit, let's go to the realities of what has happened. So you have um, heads of accounting departments and heads of supply chain management. Mm -hmm. Each and every one of those officers has had a chance to explain uh, disparities either in their sources of income mm -hmm. uh, versus their lifestyle and uh, where they've been able to provide explanations or where there were any red flags, those have been addressed. Where there are red flags, there is a team that has, uh, again, it's a multi-agency team. I'm not at liberty to disclose okay. yeah. the people leading that exercise, mm -hmm. but it is being done. And what will happen is where there are clear cases of people having abused their positions of trust mm -hmm. um, to enrich themselves, those who will follow the channel that you have already seen. All Today, right. as we speak, the courts are congested. They can't even find a date to hear some of these corruption cases. Let me take you back to the lifestyle audit, because at the time the president announced it, no yes. less than the leader of majority in the Senate, Kipchumba yes. Murkomen, in a televised interview, questioned this lifestyle audit. In fact, spoke about it targeting the deputy president. But one of the other issues he was raising is how is it going to happen? And so that today you sit here and tell us, yes, it has happened. It's not a lifestyle expose. Do you see that there are Kenyans out there who will be like, OK, so he announced it has happened. Why is all this shrouded in mystery? Yes, there's a level to an extent you cannot say certain things. But if it's just going to be something we don't understand how it's happening, what kind of details, anything to show that this this thing is real and it's not some PR exercise. Do you, so that even do your you own, doubt yeah. for a minute mm -hmm. that this issue around corruption is a figment of the government's imagination or more so the president's imagination? It's an issue. Why do you think that even you guys, uh, the press, every Friday you're hanging outside the CID headquarters waiting to see what's going to happen? Sophia, you know, I don't want to comment on conjecture because it's not my place to do so. But it's um, a member of, also, of the party I who's also, concerned about how the government I, I, I also, is going about this lifestyle audit. I so also didn't have the benefit of listening to what the Honorable Kipchumba may have or may not have said. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, that's not something I can comment on. So you do not you think know. there should be any transparency? Sorry to interject. No, I think, I think Kenyans are not looking for a, a novel on who owns what. I think what they want to know is if somebody has stolen money that should be for public service, they should be held accountable and they should appear uh, before a court of law. Mm -hmm. And that is happening. I don't think for any minute, uh, if you go to the ordinary Kenyan, I don't think they doubt for a minute the sincerity yeah. of this administration to be deal with corruption. But I have to say where this frustration is coming from and why, what would make this conversation a lot more interesting for all of us, uh, and, and I speak for the president when I say this, mm -hmm. is that we need to see movement in the judiciary. Mm -hmm. The buck stops with the judiciary. The supply chain of graft suspects has not stopped. But what we need to see is movement at the final end. But if they feel movement... these cases are not cases that uh, would lead to convictions. So do you fault the in, judiciary? I'm not faulting anyone. I'm just saying the frustration here for most Kenyans is that they want to see these issues closed. They have been commenced, but remember, in, in, a, in a democratic society such as ours that recognizes the separation of powers, the executive has done its role. The legislature has provided the legal and policy framework within which the executive can act. Mm -hmm. Now the arm of government responsible for putting this thing to bed is the judiciary. And judiciary would argue it only acts on what it gets so that to say... Uh, do you think, Sophia, there's a, there's a shortage convict. of things for them to act on? I will go you back guys to... report every week on corruption cases that are before the judiciary. Yeah. Ask them yeah. where these matters are and if they can be concluded either which way, uh, you know, and I think we're not trying to be prejudicial here in terms of the outcome. So the slow pace is concerned. But it's not just for me. I think Across it's for, the board, for of course. every Kenyan. Yeah. And I think the real emphasis of this discussion around corruption, for me, would be at two points. One is, like you rightly said, what are the preventative and measures? We'll to that, yeah. And then two, once a prosecution has happened, what happens at the tail end? Because it's not, it's not the place of the executive 
to now be judge, jury, and executioner. Mm -hmm. That role has its owner in law and in constitution. Okay. I'll take you back to the point you made about the ESCC has the mandate to carry out this lifestyle audit. We've heard about the wealth declarations many a times, and those conversations happen whether it's in social media. You'll see one person today, they're driving a car, tomorrow they have all these two choppers, and public servants are to submit their wealth declaration every mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. But there's always the concern about, does ESCC even have the capacity for all the public servants we have, and those that are in their mm -hmm. uh, mandate to look into that I submit by wealth declaration. They go and ascertain that what I have submitted is the case and then two years later go and see what has changed and moved so that do you think they have capacity to conduct that mandate? I think I have a lot of faith in institutions of uh, government and institutions generally because institutions are better than dealing with individual faith. However, can more be done to strengthen the capacity of institutions? So in this last budget, even though we took uh, quite, a, quite a hit in terms of uh, austerity measures that needed to be taken in order mm -hmm. to balance the budget, mm -hmm. we still ring-fenced funds for investigative agencies, the ESCC included, mm -hmm. and specifically to allow the judiciary to complete you know, a fantastic program mm -hmm. on the expansion of its court infrastructure, yeah. you know. And, and that level of interdependency between the arms of government is so critical in this fight. So even the president has taken his portion of this fight. He has owned it. He has delivered on it. And he has done everything within his power yeah. to ensure that those tasked with those responsibilities are doing their work with a free hand. Okay. Now, would we like to see more in terms of outcomes yes. that change that would lead to behavior change? Mm -hmm. That will only happen when people go to the slammer. Yeah, and I was saying that because ESCC, we have not seen an outcome of this wealth declarations, lifestyle audits are not making sense or we need to pursue this, that hasn't happened. So that if you say, okay, they're doing it, and they themselves have lamented that they are inconsistent in that inconsistencies in law that make it difficult for them to access this information because of the legal hurdles. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole different conversation. But the preventative aspect, if miss, a lot of confidence was put in that at the beginning. We were told this is a watertight system, but as we saw from the Auditor General's report later, pretty much calling for an overhaul, that it, ha it was so porous. There were different things that were said about how it made it easy for people to loot. So that on one hand, we're prosecuting, we're saying judiciary, but what can government, and what has government done to fix IFMIS? It manages these finances, all these monies, but still, the one announcement we saw from the PS Treasury was that passwords were going to be changed. As to whether someone seated anywhere can access IFMIS and do anything, we do not know if these changes have been made. Um, it's very dangerous to criminalize technology when the problem is not technology. The problem is people. Um, and IFMIS, even when there were breaches of integrity, uh, particularly with the NYS matter, that had nothing to do with the system, but had everything to do with people and the integrity of people. If people have colluded to be able to want to steal mm -hmm. and they use their preferred access or their credentials to steal in the system, it's very hard to stop them. But you can't pick them up. Allow me to and jump the in there can and, pick them and up. disagree on them yes. when you say it has nothing to do with technology. If a technology, it can have security functions that if you try to steal, or as you say, these individuals and scrupulous people do it, they'll be caught. But this was a system where the Auditor General's report said in some instances, someone from an undisclosed location could have multiple accounts, mm -hmm. access if missed, do all manner of transactions without anyone knowing who it was. Mm -hmm. So it's not a function of the person. The system allows it's free for all. When was that, when was that report dated? I will find out the exact date, but so I will facilitate that, you with that The Auditor report. General... I mean, it's his job to find gaps, and that's the job of a good Auditor General. But the reality is, again, and I insist, there's nothing wrong with IFMIS. There's nothing wrong with an Oracle ERP that is deployed in, in government. What is the issue is the integrity of the users. So if I am a user and I share my password, right, uh, and I have access to an approval 
and I collude with somebody who is raising a payment request. Mm -hmm. And the guy on the end of the system that authorizes the payment is also part of the collusion. It's very difficult to pick up, and this happens. But now, with the strengthening of all the, I don't know, with now, for us moving more procurement onto, onto IFMI system, first of all, the loading of the budget and the commitment of costs so that you can only spend against what is in the budget and those approvals must go right until the desk of the accounting officer. In most cases, that will be the principal secretary. Mm -hmm. So you have not had in the recent past of big uh, issues with IFMIS. Has we got investment, NYS2 after NYS1. NYS2 had nothing to do with IFMIS. And if you walk through the system, all those payments were issues that were at the point of being raised. We are yet to find out because this is uh, nine billion was lost. Is it eight billion? What is being prosecuted now is about four hundred million. So it could turn out to Ag have been the again. Case. Don't demonize technology. If somebody colluded to supply air, that has nothing to do with the system, but everything to do with the person. Let's and talk about persons. Those people will be identified yeah. and dealt with. Let's talk about persons. And the president, while there's government and there's a public service, he has appointees, his cabinet. All right? And I want to take you through just some of the scenarios we've seen in the recent past. We've seen the president publicly, angrily criticize, call out CSQ injury over the non-payment of genuine farmers. And now we saw Kiunjuri talking about even the maize that was bought that is in the silos is not good for human consumption. So the ball was dropped clearly by individuals in the ministry. Again, we saw the mercury sugar debacle. Um, there was that gazette notice that Rotich was criticized for. There were investigations in parliament. Aidan Mohammed, again, Kiunjuri was there. Matiang is one who had raised the flag around um, poisonous sugar. We saw a report changed in Parliament. The night before it was presented, one report was saying, find them responsible. The next day it was saying further investigations. C.S. Balala, 11 rhinos, country's treasure. They die in an exercise he oversaw, despite advice that, according to information that came from the former chair of the board, should not have happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I could go on and on. Mati Yangi, the other day after the Fort Turner accident, said, I take responsibility and more needs to be done. The question becomes, what does taking responsibility mean? So to my question, these are the president's appointees. Mm -hmm. When the president comes and gets angry, like I would, at something like this happening to the country, when he could fire, get people who can actually get the job done, isn't the president not leading from the beginning? A president who in 2015, cabinet members who are mentioned in corruption were let go. So what has changed? I'm not understanding what you're saying because none of the examples you have talked about are talking about corruption. No, it's about accountability, not corruption. Accountability that CSS appointed by the president, that in the various dockets, when the drop ball has clearly been dropped mm -hmm. and it's more Nancy that's suffering, we do not see accountability uh, at the top. The president comes to ventilate like any other ordinary Monanchi, yet he has power to do something about it. Uh, the president also has a lot of faith in his cabinet and uh, they know that they serve at the pleasure of the president. I don't think anybody in the cabinet is under any other illusion that um, their tenure in cabinet is subject to any, any other forces or any third parties. However, I think the president is also someone who is extremely fair and he even when he displays outward uh, manifestation of anger, he's giving you a chance to basically go and put things in order. Mm -hmm. uh, his appetite to mix things about has never been called into question. He has done it before. Why isn't he doing it now? When things we see, we cover those stories. Uh, Kenyans see farmers suffer. Rhinos die. I've been in this game long enough to know when uh, a situation can be manufactured. So all so these I'll give situations you a simple, have been... I'll give you an example, right? The issue around the rhinos. So it's a travesty and it's tragic that it happened, you know? There is a back and forth as to what may have caused the situation. The appropriate thing to do is what has been done now, which is to investigate, get to the bottom of it, and ensure that we don't lose any more of those animals. Now, 
scalping the minister may not produce any meaningful result at that point in time. The president is also a politician, and there are many things he needs to balance, one of which is just keeping what is a good team. Even when you have, uh, and you're playing a soccer match, you may be tempted to make substitutions all the time, but sometimes it's not necessary. You need to let things play out, see what happens, and at some point, if he feels that any member of the cabinet is not pulling their weight, he has never shied away. I mean, you have seen him do it before. I don't think he'll have a problem doing it at any time in the future. But I also think we need to be cautious about proxy wars that find their way into the press and inevitably try to implicate or try to you land call the, you, a minister. I, I, you sound like you know, you're, you're, you're trivializing it, call it tr whatever kind of wars, when if we forget whatever may be happening in the political scene and shenanigans, the rhinos have died, given, okay? Yes. Um, maize farmers, genuine ones are not being paid and scrupulous people are getting millions pocketing. Mm -hmm. Now the maize that was actually bought it's in the silos is not good for human consumption. Mm -hmm. We were told about sugar with mercury, now we don't know what happened to that story. So that, and, and as you mm -hmm. answer that, whether you're also concerned with the attitude when some of these yeses are held to account or criticized, take. Malala said, go to hell. I only respond to my appointing authority, who is Uhuru Kenyatta. While he serves at the pleasure of the president, he holds that office, you know, for the people of Kenya. The president is appointed, I mean, uh, elected by Kenyans. Kinjuri said he'll deal with his haters. Does that kind of attitude, does it concern you? Um, I still don't understand. In delivering. I, I still don't understand what your question is. You may dislike somebody or you may find that they're arrogant, but I keep telling people arrogance is not a crime. It's not an offense. There is a process for removing cabinet secretaries if they have not done their work. Yeah. Parliament has uh, shown that it has the appetite to do so when it is, when it is pushed to the wall. Now, my view here yes. is very simple. Yes. On, on the issues of accountability, every cabinet secretary is accountable to the president and to themselves as a collective. I don't think there's any cabinet secretary who has, first of all, uh, gone against their collective responsibility as members of the cabinet mm -hmm. or uh, deliberately mm -hmm. gone against express instructions or the desires uh, of, of the president. I have not seen that happening. And if it were to happen, I don't think that person would last uh, a day okay. in the job. Final question as we wrap up, at least to touch on one of the big four housing. And it has created a bit of confusion, 1.5 uh, tax. Uh, to build houses, affordable houses, so that some of the questions we have received, um, and I was writing them down just from our social media, that it's discriminatory. Only targets Kenyans on payroll who are two million. Number two, someone was saying, it's, there's no assurance I will get a house. Number three, what of those who don't want houses? Number four, we are being told that it could be converted to some pension and be repaid. W would you please clarify on that? What really will happen? Of, of you know, of all the projects uh, that are building towards uh, the actualization of the big four, mm -hmm. housing is perhaps the most interesting and exciting um, of them all. And uh, there are many questions because what has happened with, with this housing, the home ownership plan, is that it has turned conventional wisdom on its head. So everyone was expecting the government to be the one to go out and build these houses. That's not going to happen. The government has just created the framework for these houses to be built. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the levy of 1.5 that is going to be on your, yourself as a salaried mm -hmm. employee, for example, that money is actually not a tax. It's a saving. And you get relief for it. Remember that. You get relief for that 1.5. What relief? Tax relief. So whatever you pay, you get it back in tax relief. At the same time, that 1.5 goes towards building a saving for you. So, Isn't that uh, illegal? Because we have pension and then a tax it, for housing, it, it is then not, it is not illegal. it's now I, I being think, taken to pension or to save? I, I think it's not illegal. And I think we should try not to trivialize uh, some of these things because no one has taken the time to read and understand mm -hmm. what it is that this housing plan involves. Can I, if you allow me, because I know we are, I know we are tight on time. Yes. 
The housing plan has, has multiple facets to it. One is today there is a shortage. Every year we build, we, we, there's a demand, a growing demand of over 200,000 yes. homes yes. for regular people, not high end. This is low end and middle class, lower middle class homes. For, for, these are regular folk. Today, on the mortgage front, there's less than 24,000 mortgages in Kenya. Okay. Right? So there's, a, there's an issue there. The demand for an affordable home far outstrips any supply that there is. Okay. Now, what the plan is is very simple. For us to build houses at scale, we need to create an off-taker. There needs to be somebody mm -hmm. to, to be able to buy those houses and then allocate them. So what this, uh, this levy is doing is going towards something called the Kenya Housing Development Fund. The Kenya Housing Development Fund is a critical component of this housing plan. So let's say you today are a developer and you, with the Nairobi, let's say Nairobi County, we have identified a piece of land. Yeah. That land has been given gratis, free of charge by the county. The government has terminated water, power, and other infrastructure, sewage infrastructure on that property. You as a developer build your 10,000 houses to a controlled standard, something called the development guidelines uh, framework. Yes. You build those houses. Yeah. This housing fund seconds, buys yeah. the houses from the development fund and then allocates them to applicants. The applicants are you and I, the people who have been paying this levy. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on where you live, your income status, it will give you better access to the housing. Mm -hmm. So the more needy you are, the better chances you have of yeah. getting the house. And we should not again look at it in a five-year cycle because even though we plan to do half a million homes yeah. over the next uh, four years or five, four and a half years, um, this is something that we are putting right. for continuity. And if you don't get a house, you get your money. You get, you get, you have All access right. to your money, you so it's not going anywhere. To. All right, thank you very much. I wish we had more time in Zokawaita. I know <laughs> we will have you again. Will you come back? I'll always come back. You'll always come back. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. And Zoka Waita, he's the chief of staff uh, and the president Kenyatta's administration as well as the head of delivery. You're watching Checkpoint, and uh, Robinson Kenya is coming up next.